Guatsi Halpa Duhinama Itzatuitsa Shui Mihanu. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to welcome you to the Department of the Interior, which sits on the ancestral homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway people. Land acknowledgments recognize the indigenous people who are the original stewards of the lands where we live and work. Making them is part of acknowledging who we are and who has been here. It's about the history of the land and the people. This is the same reason that we often speak about traditional or indigenous knowledge. My ancestors live sustainably in the Southwest and survived famine and drought with the understanding that future generations would rely on their hard work and sacrifices. I can't help but think about the environmental tragedies that might have been avoided, like the Dust Bowl, the extinction of the passenger pigeon, and the growth of extreme wildfires across the West if the federal government had consulted with and respected the practices of stewarding the earth that indigenous people developed over millennia. As the federal government moved the country west, they also moved to exterminate, eradicate, and assimilate Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians. The languages, cultures, religions, traditional practices, and even the history of Native communities, all of it was targeted for destruction. Nowhere is that clearer than in the legacy of federal Indian boarding schools. For more than a century, tens of thousands of indigenous children were taken from their communities and forced into boarding schools run by the US government, specifically the Department of the Interior and religious institutions. The consequences of federal Indian boarding school policies, including the intergenerational trauma caused by forced family separation and cultural eradication, which were inflicted upon generations of children as young as four years old, are heartbreaking and undeniable. When my maternal grandparents were only eight years old, they were stolen from their parents' culture and communities and forced to live in boarding schools until the age of 13. Many children like them never made it back to their homes. Each of those children is a missing family member, a person who was not able to live out their purpose on this earth because they lost their lives as part of this terrible system. This is not new to us. It's not new to many of us. As indigenous people, we have lived with the intergenerational trauma of federal Indian boarding school policies for many years. But what is new is the determination in the Biden-Harris administration to make a lasting difference in the impact of this trauma for future generations. The federal policies that attempted to wipe out native identity, language, and culture continue to manifest in the pain tribal communities face today, including cycles of violence and abuse, disappearance of indigenous people, premature deaths, poverty and loss of wealth, mental health disorders and substance abuse. Recognizing the impacts of the federal Indian boarding school system cannot just be a historical reckoning we must also chart a path forward to deal with these legacy issues. To address the intergenerational impact of federal Indian boarding schools and to promote spiritual and emotional healing in our communities, we must shed light on the unspoken traumas of the past. Today, we take a critical step forward in that work. Last June, I launched the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative a comprehensive effort to address the legacy of federal Indian boarding school policies. That initiative starts with shining a bright and undeniable spotlight in the form of an investigative report led by Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, Brian Newland. This report is a significant step by the federal government to address the facts and consequences of these policies. I am so incredibly proud of the work that Assistant Secretary Newland and his entire team did on the first volume of this report. 
I particularly want to acknowledge the staff at the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration, which is managing the document collection, review, and records management of this initiative. The vast majority of the work being released today was done by Indigenous staff here at the department. In this, in, in this department and various offices who worked through their own trauma and pain to ensure that we have this report to release today. I honor all of you for your contributions to moving our country forward to provide a better future for our youth. This report lays the groundwork for the continued research and work of the Interior Department to address the intergenerational trauma and consequences of federal Indian boarding school policies. And with the recent, recent congressional investment of $7 million for this effort in fiscal year 2022, we are grateful to have much needed resources to continue the work. Our efforts will include steps we can and must take now to alter the course of our future. We must work to preserve native languages. We must invest in support services for indigenous peoples, and we must bear witness to the stories of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian people. I come from ancestors who endured the horrors of the Indian boarding school assimilation policies carried out by the same department that I now lead. This department was responsible for operating what we now know to be 408 federal boarding schools across 37 states or then territories, including 21 schools in Alaska and seven schools in Hawaii. Now we are uniquely positioned to assist in the effort to recover the dark history of these institutions that have haunted our families for too long. As a Pueblo woman, it is my responsibility, and frankly, it's my legacy. As part of the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative and in response to recommendations from the report, today I am launching a year-long tour, The Road to Healing. I will travel across the country to use my platform to elevate American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian survivors of the Federal Indian Boarding School system and give them the opportunity to share their stories, help connect communities with trauma-informed support, and facilitate the collection of a permanent oral history. This is one step among many that we will take. The department's work thus far shows that an all-of-government approach is necessary to strengthen and rebuild the bonds within Native communities that federal Indian boarding schools set out to break. With the president's direction, we have begun working through the White House Council of Native American Affairs on the path ahead to preserve tribal languages, invest in survivor-focused services, and honor our trust obligations to indigenous communities. The fact that I am standing here today as the first indigenous cabinet secretary is testament to the strength and determination of native people. I am here because my ancestors persevered. I stand on the shoulders of my grandmother and my mother, and the work we will do with the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative will have a transformational impact on the generations who follow. I thank you all so much for being here and for covering this critical issue. And now I want to introduce a colleague that I am so proud to serve next to Assistant Secretary Brian Newland.